In the spring, when Thomas was three or four moons old, we returned from Shiota to Wishto, and soon after set out to go to Fort Pitt to dispose of our fur and skins that we had taken in the winter and procure some necessary articles for the use of our family. I had then been with the Indians four summers and four winters, and had become so far accustomed to their mode of living, habits and dispositions, that my anxiety to get away, to be set at liberty and leave them, had almost subsided. With them was my home. My family was there. And there I had many friends to whom I was warmly attached in consideration of the favours, affection and friendship with which they had uniformly treated me from the time of my adoption. Our labour was not severe, and that of one year was exactly similar in almost every respect to that of the others, without that endless variety that is to be observed in the common labour of the white people. Notwithstanding the Indian women have all the fuel and bread to procure, and the cooking to perform, their task is probably not harder than that of white women who have those articles provided for them, and their cares certainly are not half as numerous nor as great. In the summer season we planted, tended and harvested our corn, and generally had all our children with us, but had no master to oversee or drive us, so that we could work as leisurely as we pleased. We had no ploughs on the Ohio, but performed the whole process of planting and hoeing with a small tool that resembled, in some respects, a hoe with a very short handle. Our cooking consisted in pounding our corn into samp or hominy, boiling the hominy, making now and then a cake and baking it in the ashes, and in boiling or roasting our venison. As our cooking and eating utensils consisted of a hominy block and pestle, a small kettle, a knife or two, and a few vessels of bark or wood, it required but little time to keep them in order for use. Spinning, weaving, sewing, stocking, knitting and the like, are arts which have never been practised in the Indian tribes generally. After the Revolutionary War, I learned to sew, so that I could make my own clothing after a poor fashion. But the other domestic arts I have been wholly ignorant of the application of since my captivity. In the season of hunting, it was our business, in addition to our cooking, to bring home the game that was taken by the Indians, dress it and carefully preserve the eatable meat, and prepare or dress the skins. Our clothing was fastened together with strings of deer skin and tied on with the same. In that manner we lived without any of those jealousies, quarrels and revengeful battles between families and individuals, which have been common in the Indian tribes since the introduction of ardent spirits amongst them. The use of ardent spirits amongst the Indians, and the attempts which have been made to civilise and Christianise them by the white people, has constantly made them worse and worse, increased their vices and robbed them of many of their virtues, and will ultimately produce their extermination. I have seen in a number of instances the effects of education upon some of our Indians who were taken when young from their families and placed at school before they had had an opportunity to contract many Indian habits and they're kept till they arrived to manhood. But I have never seen one of those but what was an Indian in every respect after he returned. Indians must and will be Indians in spite of all the means that can be used for their cultivation in the sciences and arts. One thing only marred my happiness while I lived with them on the Ohio, and that was the recollection that I had once had tender parents and a home that I loved. Aside from that consideration, or if I had been taken in infancy, I should have been contented in my situation. Notwithstanding all that has been said against the Indians, in consequence of their cruelties to their enemies, cruelties that I have witnessed and had abundant proof of, it is a fact that they are naturally kind, tender and peaceable towards their friends, and strictly honest, and that those cruelties have been practised only upon their enemies, according to their idea of justice. At the time we left Wishto, it was impossible for me to suppress a sigh of regret on parting with those who had truly been my friends, with those whom I had every reason to respect. On account of a part of our family living at Genishau, we thought it doubtful whether we should return directly from Pittsburgh, or go from thence on a visit to see them. Our company consisted of my husband, my two Indian brothers, my little son and myself. We embarked in a canoe that was large enough to contain ourselves and our effects, and proceeded on our voyage up the river. Nothing remarkable occurred to us on our way, till we arrived at the mouth of a creek which Sheninji and my brother said was the outlet of Sandusky Lake, where, as they said, two or three English traders in fur and skins had kept a trading house, but a short time before, though they were then absent. 
We had passed the trading house but a short distance when we met three white men floating down the river with the appearance of having been recently murdered by the Indians. We supposed them to be the bodies of the traders whose store we had passed the same day. Sheninji being alarmed for fear of being apprehended as one of the murderers, if he should go on, resolved to put about immediately, and we accordingly returned to where the traders had lived and there landed. At the trading house we found a party of Shawnee Indians who had taken a young white man prisoner and had just begun to torture him for the sole purpose of gratifying their curiosity in exulting at his distress. They at first made him stand up, while they slowly pared his ears and split them into strings. They then made a number of slight incisions in his face, and then bound him upon the ground, rolled him in the dirt, and rubbed it in his wounds, some of them at the same time whipping him with small rods. The poor fellow cried for mercy and yelled most piteously. The sight of his distress seemed too much for me to endure. I begged of them to desist. I entreated them with tears to release him. At length they attended to my intercessions and set him at liberty. He was shockingly disfigured, bled profusely, and appeared to be in great pain. But as soon as he was liberated, he made off in haste, which was the last I saw of him. We soon learned that the same party of Shawnees had, but a few hours before, massacred the three white traders whom we saw in the river, and had plundered their store. We, however, were not molested by them, and after a short stay at that place, moved up the creek about forty miles to a Shawnee town, which the Indians called Gaugush Shoga, which being interpreted signifies a mask or a false face. The creek that we went up was called Kandusky. It was now summer, and having tarried a few days at Gaugush Shoga, we moved on up the creek to a place that was called Yiskahwana, meaning in English open mouth. As I have before observed, the family to which I belonged was part of a tribe of Seneca Indians who lived at that time at a place called Genishau, from the name of the tribe, that was situated on a river of the same name, which is now called Genesee. The word Genishau signifies a shining, clear or open place. Those of us who lived on the Ohio had frequently received invitations from those at Genishau by one of my brothers, who usually went and returned every season to come and live with them, and my two sisters had been gone almost two years. While we were at Yiskawana, my brother arrived there from Genisho and insisted so strenuously upon our going home, as he called it, with him, that my two brothers concluded to go and to take me with them. By this time, the summer was gone, and the time for harvesting corn had arrived. My brothers, for fear of the rainy season setting in early, thought it best to set out immediately that we might have good travelling, Sheninji consented to have me go with my brothers, but concluded to go down the river himself with some fur and skins which he had on hand, spend the winter in hunting with his friends, and come to me in the spring following. Accordingly, agreed upon, and he set out for Wishto, and my three brothers and myself, with my little son on my back, at the same time set out for Genishau. We came on to Upper Sandusky, to an Indian town that we found deserted by its inhabitants, in consequence of their having recently murdered some English traders, who resided amongst them. That town was Oned and had been occupied by Delaware Indians, who, when they left it, buried their provision in the earth in order to preserve it from their enemies, or to have a supply for themselves if they should chance to return. My brothers understood the customs of the Indians when they were obliged to fly from their enemies, and suspecting that their corn at least must have been hid, made diligent search, and at length found a large quantity of it together with beans, sugar and honey, so carefully buried that it was completely dry and as good as when they left it. As our stock of provision was scanty, we considered ourselves extremely fortunate in finding so seasonable a supply, with so little trouble. Having caught two or three horses that we found there, and furnished ourselves with a good store of food, we travelled on till we came to the mouth of French Creek, where we hunted two days, and from thence came on to Conowongo Creek, where we were obliged to stay seven or ten days, in consequence of our horses having left us and straying into the woods. The horses, however, were found, and we again prepared to resume our journey. During our stay at that place the rain fell fast, and had raised the creek to such a height that it was seemingly impossible for us to cross it. A number of times we ventured in, but were compelled to return, barely escaping with our lives. At length we succeeded in swimming our horses and reached the opposite shore, though I but just escaped with my little boy from being drowned. 
From Sandusky, the path that we travelled was crooked and obscure, but was tolerably well understood by my oldest brother, who had travelled it a number of times when going to and returning from the Cherokee Wars. The fall by this time was considerably advanced, and the rains attended with cold winds continued daily to increase the difficulties of travelling. From Conowongo we came to a place, called by the Indians Chewa Shungao Tao, and from that to Unawam Gua, which means an eddy, not strong, where the early frosts had destroyed the corn so that the Indians were in danger of starving for the want of bread. Having rested ourselves two days at that place, we came on to Kaniadea and stayed one day, and then continued our march till we arrived at Genishau. Genishau at that time was a large Seneca town, thickly inhabited, lying on Genesee River, opposite what is now called the Free Ferry, adjoining Fallbrook, and about southwest of the present village of Geneseo, the county seat for the county of Livingston in the state of New York. Those only who have travelled on foot the distance of five or six hundred miles through an almost pathless wilderness can form an idea of the fatigue and sufferings that I endured on that journey. My clothing was thin and illy calculated to defend me from the continually drenching rains with which I was daily completely wet, and at night with nothing but my wet blanket to cover me, I had to sleep on the naked ground, and generally without a shelter, save such as nature had provided. In addition to all that, I had to carry my child, then about nine months old, every step of the journey on my back or in my arms, and provide for his comfort and prevent his suffering, as far as my poverty of means would admit. Such was the fatigue that I sometimes felt, that I thought it impossible for me to go through, and I would almost abandon the idea of even trying to proceed. My brothers were attentive, and at length, as I have stated, we reached our place of destination, in good health, and without having experienced a day's sickness from the time we left Yiskawana. We were kindly received by my Indian mother and the other members of the family, who appeared to make me welcome, and my two sisters, whom I had not seen in two years, received me with every expression of love and friendship, and that they really felt what they expressed, I have never had the least reason to doubt. The warmth of their feelings, the kind reception which I met with, and the continued favours that I received at their hands, riveted my affection for them so strongly that I am constrained to believe that I loved them as I should have loved my own sister had she lived, and I had been brought up with her.'